Okay. So everybody is very welcome to our first event of Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Um, the theme of our week is Eating Disorder Recovery and Beyond, Respecting Individuality and Identity. And when we were thinking about the theme, um, of course, Colm Nocta came to mind with his new book around the 4-7 zone. So I'm delighted to welcome Coleman today. Um, just to remind everybody that this is a webinar, so your cameras are off and your mics are off. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end and you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. Um, Coleman is a child and adolescent psychotherapist. He is an author of two books. Um, he's a lecturer in SETU in Waterford, and he's a regular contributor to the Ray Darcy show on their parenting slot and writes a column for the Irish Examiner. So we are delighted to have Coleman today to talk to us about ideas around maybe happiness and satisfaction in eating disorder, recovery and treatment, and in particular about um, how the ideas in his book, The Four Seven Zone, can um, be applied to the world of eating disorders. So Coleman, you're very welcome today. Thanks, Moon Harry. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So to start off with Coleman, could you explain to us what The Four Seven, Seven Zone is and how you came about this idea? Yeah, well, it came off the back of, uh, I suppose, over 20 years of clinical experience. Um, and I suppose it was something I used in therapy quite a lot with young people that I, I would be working with. Um, and it basically came out of the idea of when when you're assessing someone from, from a mental health perspective, you'll oftentimes ask them about how's your mood, how's your appetite, how's your sleep, how's your energy levels, all of these sorts of things. Um, and you'd ask them to rate it out of 10. And what I realized was that everybody who was sitting in front of me was rating themselves as one, two, three and eight, nine, ten. And what I thought about was I never see the four to seven people. They don't seem to end up sitting in front of me. So it kind of made me think about maybe there's an approach here. Maybe we can learn from the people we never see. You know, what what is it about that? And, and it, it got me thinking about you know, when we think about our lives, you know, take, for example, um, the advice much of the time is pushing ourselves outside of the comfort zone. It's about going to the edges all the time. So even if, if we don't want to use the expression of healthy eating or weight loss or anything like this, there's oftentimes these extreme measures around getting your heart rate up really high and getting your calories down really low. Um, but when we come to a, a mental health and emotional health perspective, it's actually the opposite. You know, you, what you want is to maintain that equilibrium and that balance in the middle. And so what I was trying to do was to try and help uh, clients to kind of find a way of finding their way back into the middle and almost asking themselves, you know, is that out of, is that a four to seven reaction? So if something happens and my reaction is is extreme, you know, or like you know, you'd have parents coming into me and one might say, my child is having a hard time. I'm going to move them out of the school. And then the other parents saying, no, they have to sit through it and get through it. And you're kind of saying, well, these are two extreme reactions. Maybe there's other options. Maybe there's a middle that we can look at. And so the four to seven zone was this way of, of kind of becoming your own therapist. It was about asking yourself, where's my reaction? Where am I on this eight to nine? Am I eight, nine, 10? Or am I one, two, three? And trying to find a way back to the middle. Um, and it was one that, clients and young people and patients would come back to me all the time and like I was using it for years and I remember meeting someone I think it was out in Liffey Valley somewhere and they said I'm still doing my four to seven you know and it was a kind of a thing that it was just a, a kind of relatable template um, that people could use to try and manage that um, and people would say to me all the time is that very four to seven Coleman you know if I was overreacting to something but um, so yeah so it was just a, a very simple uh principle of trying to maintain balance but the second part of that was it came out of how I believe society is going um, and I think there is a an extremist view on almost everything you know that we're always in demand of picking a lane you are you with us are you against us are you up are you down are you left are you right are you the, um, and almost that middle is kind of not valued almost or you know it's certainly not encouraged um, 
that that we almost have to nail our colours to masks uh, in certain ways. And I, I don't believe that that's how we get compromise and how we get progress and how we get discussion. It's usually about meeting somewhere in the middle is how, you know, we become less fractured and more aligned. Um, and <clears throat> I think the world of social media, the world of modern day media and the, the way in which our discourse is going is kind of an anti-balanced culture. Uh, it's almost... And, you know, if, if you're sitting on the fence, you're almost discarded for that. Um, and also, I, I know from working in the media from time to time that if I say something in the 8, 9, 10 zone, it'll get coverage. But if I say something in the 4 to 7 zone, it's dismissed. You know, you'll get people will ring you and say, do you think mobile phones, the renation of children's lives? And you'd say, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. They'll say, I'll come back to you. And they'll get someone else who will say that. You know, so um, the extreme sells, it's sensational, is is topical and, and oftentimes what is shared is what is uh, popular as opposed to what is true. Um, and so it, I wrote the book on the basis of something that was working well in therapy, but also something that probably holds a, a mirror up to the society that we live in today that isn't very balanced, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And I suppose, you know, through the lens of eating disorders, there's so much black and white thinking. There's so much all or nothingness. And, um, you know, working with people, we're all the time trying to get them to be able to tolerate the middle ground. And also, I suppose it provokes such um, all or nothing responses in other people who are looking after that person, that sometimes everybody needs to kind of collaborate and compromise. And a lot of the a lot of the work, you know, I would do with families and that is about being able to kind of let go of needing to be in the eight to nine or the one to three and come into the middle. So it makes perfect sense. So yeah, um, if, if I could say something to that, I mean, I think that all of nothing position is it's very attractive that things could be that simple. Do you know what I mean? The idea that like it's a very childhood type way where we grow up and we think cowboys and Indians, cow cops and robbers, goodies and baddies. It's very divided and it's very simple to navigate the world when things are that clear. Um, it's oftentimes when we realize actually it's not, you know, it's the grayness of, you know, even through friendships in primary school, you're my best friend and we don't like them. And then when you get into secondary school and you start to realize actually quite a lot of these people are gray, you know, there's things I like about them and then there's other parts and these things coexist in the one person and it becomes quite unsettling. So there's something very attractive to an all or nothing world in the case of eat less, move more good move less eat more bad you know it's a very it's a it's an alluring and seductive way of seeing the world because i can measure my value in such concrete terms when in actual fact i think value is a much more complex nuanced concept than that but um but i, I think that 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 extreme of all or nothing uh sells you know it, it's a very attractive one because it's about gratification and intensity um whereas fulfillment and consistency are less attractive they're harder to sell you know i think if my book said the five steps to happiness i would have sold more copies but uh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily how it works you know so let's set the scene a bit and you do that in your book as well um so if we think about you know what the four thinking about what the four seven zone can bring to our understanding of eating disorders that when we think about the world that we live in and you've touched on that already we can see that the world you know it provides the way it is at the moment provides kind of perfect conditions in which an eating disorder can take root yeah mm -hmm. so can you set the scene for us a bit and give us your thoughts on that i, I suppose i would always see the eating disorder as a response to the problem as opposed to the problem itself. So I'd see it as a way of trying to cope, control or communicate with something that's going on. And in the world that we live in, that is so extreme in its way, it, it, it has this drive for perfectionism, this drive for extremists, you know, that, that idea that we need to make an impact. We need to have an impression. We need to. Um, and it's. <clears throat> It's creating a pressure on young people, which I think leaves them more susceptible to coming overwhelmed and out of control because we can't live to those ideals, you know, and, and you know, the idea that um, that we should never be unhappy or we should never be bored or we should never fail and we should never disappoint people. Those the greater those expectations, the more potential we have to feel that we're not enough or that we're failing. Um, and I think the 
the greatest challenge to young people is that sense of enough. I think that's a really hard thing to get. And I think parents, school systems, culture drive us to keep improving, 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 getting better and better and better. Like no tree ever grew to the sky. Like there's a point at which we need to plateau. And I think the idea of um, pressure and, and it is if you're thinking about the challenges that people are living in, expectation and pressure are massive. Um, and, you know, as a means of trying to manage that sense of being overwhelmed, a sense of control over something in my life feels comforting. It feels like I have a sense of mastery over something and it's something that is tangible and it's plausible and I can count it and I can see it. And um, and I think that creates the circumstances that are kind of optimal for anything sort of to exist. You know, the perfectionism, the drive for unrealistic expectation and almost society supports that, you know, um, I, I, I have a colleague coming out tomorrow in the exam where it's about this idea of how we glorify thinness, you know, from the point of view. And I've had young people who are, you know, medically compromised underweight and have adults saying to them, God, I wish I had a figure like you or, you know, this sort of really unhelpful stuff that's going on. And it's 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 an indictment of maybe those extremes that we are pursuing, you know, and the idea that um, unless you're in that extreme bracket, then you don't stand out. And it is this idea of standing out seems to be something that's kind of indelible within the culture as well. But we all can't stand out. You know, the, there's the drive to be special. By definition, special is refined for a certain group of people. It's not for everyone. If everyone's special, is no one is special. So I think the idea, and I think young people see that through perhaps performing in academics, performing in sport, performing in something to show that I'm exceptional um is the way to go and and an eating disorder there's some there's sometimes an exceptionalism in that as well because you're exceptionally disciplined exceptionally um rigid and willpower and all of those things that probably run the risk of making you feel good in the first instance that people are recognizing that in you um but it's such a slippery slope from the point of view of trying to to pull back from that you know that that's when it becomes much more difficult so yeah, I, I think in a world that is all about intensity rather than consistency, you know, the idea of, you know, the and, and you don't have to look to the you know, the lose weight things. It's like, you know, they'll sell you this ab toner where you get six pack abs in six weeks and all of this sort of stuff. Um, in actual fact, kind of slow and steady wins the race doesn't can't hold a candle to that stuff. You know, if you're looking for the answer, if someone can offer you in the shortest way possible, that's probably the way you'll go. But I can go to the gym for nine hours today. I'll look no different now than I did when I went in. But if I went 20 minutes, three times a week for six months, you might see the difference. But that's a harder sell than my ab toner, which is going to give me six pack abs in six weeks. You know, and so, um, yeah, I think all of that stuff feeds into this intensity gratification type way of fixing a problem. Um, when in actual fact, oftentimes these problems are emotional um, and they're things that need time and they need patience and they need a degree of tolerance you know the tolerance of frustration disappointment um they're not mental health issues they're life problems and we need to stop pathologizing them i think in that way um i i say oftentimes not all sadness is depression not all worry is anxiety um but in a world that says that that's not acceptable then when we do experience it we feel that we're pathologically compromised and maybe that's misinformation in many ways i mean i'm struck by how many young people these days you hear them talking about feeling anxious and being anxious and that they have anxiety um and i don't think when i was a teenager we used the word anxiety i think that we might have said oh i feel worried um but they kind of have the language for it now and it's such a seductive idea isn't it and um, the idea that you can do X, Y, and Z, and then you will feel perfect. Yeah. And, and again, that that's, that's a holy grail that is, you know, it's a chasing a rainbow, you know, there is no feeling of like happiness, even in by definition is a very momentary experience. It's not something that's, it's not a destination. Um, but the idea that we should feel happy all the time, you know, is, and again, there's many forces pushing that agenda you know about if you're only looking at the highlight reel of everyone's life you'll imagine that that's how you should be but 
Um, I think sometimes we get the mental health promotion thing a little bit wrong or we're getting it a little bit wrong. I think from the point of view of we have maybe verged into mental illness promotion as opposed to mental health promotion. You know, you only have to go on TikTok and someone will say, you know, do you ever forget things? You've got ADHD. Do you like to put things back where they belong? You've got OCD. That's not mental health promotion. That's mental illness promotion. Um, and I, I would much prefer us to, to kind of go along the mental fitness side of trying to how to manage the challenges of everyday life as opposed to trying to pathologize those. You know, I, I think that's something we need to really be careful of. But I think also the the well-being bit we can get that wrong a little bit as well i remember being at school a number of years ago and this very lovely teacher was showing me the worry wall and the worry pot and the worry blanket and the worry bucket and i was thinking man if i was a kid in this school and i didn't worry i'd think there was something wrong mm -hmm. with me you know and i think we have to be very careful around not you know the dial not overcorrecting too much in the other direction if that makes any sense you know i think um many young people come to me with something they need to fix which is something they need to experience you know yeah gosh I love that idea something they need to fix which is something they need to experience so um you talk in your book about anxiety and it's a really interesting chapter and I suppose I found it really interesting because working in the area of eating disorders, there's, you know, so much, so much anxiety in eating disorders. It's everywhere. It's, you know, every every minute of every day. Um, and in your book, you talk about anxiety creating, you know, three possible reactions, fight, flight or freeze. And one of those responses or reactions, flight, you describe as be as manifesting in perfectionism, which also is something that we see in people with eating disorders all the time. So maybe could you explain that idea for us and how you see those kind of three anxiety reactions in a person with an eating disorder? Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think the the flight piece, the flight into perfectionism or the flight into control is mm. almost like a, a means of finding one some way of managing what I'm experiencing. So what I think we can tend to do is we channel anxiety into things that are tangible when they're the source or the origin is much more vague. So for the example of a young girl who's growing up in in secondary school and maybe she was, you know, good at GA, camogie, that was her kind of token of her currency of social strength in sixth class. Now that's not valued so much anymore it's much more about makeups and discos or whatever it might be and she's finding her she can't find her feet her place in that world she's becoming overwhelmed maybe she's trying to put it into academia then find a bit of an identity there maybe she's trying something and you know the idea that this overwhelms sense of responsibility growing up maturity responsibility pressure all of that's it's so indistinct and it's not very clear Whereas if I can just control what I eat and how much I exercise, it gives me this illusion of control. So the illusion is that I'm on top of things or I can manage it. And that I, I, I would see perfectionism as part and parcel of that. The I, Perfectionism is, a, is an illusion of control. It's about if I can prepare to that nth degree, then I have I don't have to worry about being unprepared or but and that's fine until something goes wrong and then the house of cards all comes down. So I would say that perfectionism is not driven by a desire to get it right. It's driven by a fear of getting it wrong. Right. So the motivator behind all of this control is not to be impressive, but to try and uh, feel in some ways more enough or more able or more capable. And, and it is much easier to worry about something that you can do something about than it is to worry about something else. You know, so the idea that if I can just manage my diet and my exercise and I'm in total control of that, and I think about that from morning to night, it's almost 90% of my awake time is thinking about food, weight, and shape. That leaves only 5% to think about school, friendships, maturity, life, all that other stuff. And if you're given the choice, do you want to worry about things that you can control or do you want to worry about things you can't control? it's a no brainer to pick the stuff that you control. Right. So, but when we treat it, we tend to treat the 90% of the, the eating behavior, but in actual fact, the origin of the problem is in the 5%, you know? So the idea of when we offer someone treatment, 
they oftentimes see us as taking away the thing that's allowing them to function um, and exposing the bits that are really overwhelming. And I think there's a point in 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 that where we have to say, no, we want to help you with the five percent. We want to help you with that mm-hmm. life stuff that's overwhelming you, as well as helping you to not feel that you need control or flight into this as much. You know, mm-hmm. so from that point of view, I would see the flight as something into something tangible, controllable. And again, come back to those three C's: to cope, communicate, and control. You know, the action yeah. is has a function. And it is to cope. If I feel I'm on top of all this stuff, it helps me to feel on top of anything. There was a the story I heard years ago when the Titanic was sinking. <clears throat> there was somebody observed that one of the captains was organizing his filing cabinet in alphabetical order, and they thought he had lost his mind. Um, and I just saw that as no, actually, he's trying to just get some control over something because the the prospect of plunging to an icy death is not necessarily the thing he wants to think about right now and for me sometimes we can I can I see eating disorder in that way it's almost like trying to over focus on something as a means to not think about the other stuff you know um and and again in the short term that may well be effective but in the longer term creates a much more difficult problem to to overcome because you can't run away from the maturity fears or the responsibilities or the the life stuff um because, and, and oftentimes, and I, I would say many young people who engage in, in eating sort of maybe treatment which for a long time would describe themselves when when they're coming out of the other side of that, almost like they're kind of cryogenically frozen emotionally for that time because they didn't go out and meet friends or make those developmental steps that other people were making in the time because they were so consumed in the flight into perfectionism and um, that actually when they recover to that extent where they're re-entering into the world and trying to re-engage, they can feel quite behind. And it's just, it's a measure of the obsessionality of it, you know, that it almost, it stops time. And maybe that's element of the freeze, um, yeah. to, to freeze yeah. development, to freeze moving forward and even physiologically freezing our own, you know, with the onset of menstrual cycle, that sort of stuff. There's an element of being able to, pause it more than freeze it maybe I think um but yeah so I would see anxiety as as a core aspect of the presentation of eating disorder for sure and I see in many ways the eating disorder as a mechanism of managing it uh, albeit a not very long-term effective one you know yeah yeah and it strikes me that if you're thinking about that 90 percent is food weight and shape anxiety and you know five percent is all the other stuff that in treatment, so much of the focus is on the 90%. So it's kind of just intensifying all of that. And, you know, they feel maybe um, because they often feel so threatened, then it res- it prompts that response to cling more to it as well. Yeah. And I, and I think even engaging in the endless conversations about the food, weight and state, shape stuff, it tends to dominate the airtime. You know, if you can think yeah. about it, that it's still... Well, as long as people, I'm battling about all this stuff, nobody's talking about the other stuff that I don't want to talk about. You know, it's almost like the part of the story that's not being discussed is maybe the most important part yeah. to getting to the bottom of the story, you know. And um, and I think some young people are very comfortable in the battles around the food, weight and shape stuff. Um, it's a safer prospect than perhaps talking about the inner workings of their own emotional position um, and the, their fears or their desires or their worries. You know, I think that's, um, in many ways, the, it's a really effective distraction from that work, you know, in some respects. Uh, but, you know, the condition being what it is means that we have to focus on the food and the weight elements too. Um, but it's important in treatment, I think, to remember the other side. That 5% is crucially important. Um, and I really think that we need to be even more mindful of that as we go through processes rather than because if the young person sets the agenda about all food and weight, it's very easy to get sucked into that and become all about the food and weight ourselves. And I've seen whole teams of people being kind of um, distracted by that as well, you know, um, while not getting to, to maybe the bit that's a bit more uncomfortable, but a bit more, I don't want to say important, but certainly significant in terms of understanding what's going on. Yeah. 
So an, another kind of salient idea in your book is this idea that action changes our experience of things. So the thing doesn't less like, get less scary before we do it. It's that our doing the thing helps it to become less scary. Um, and I, I wanted to hear you talk about that a bit and um, maybe kind of talk through why you think that is. Yeah, I, I think there's a, an element of um, when I feel better, I'll do something different. You know, and I think it's a very yeah. common way of, you know, I'll, I'll tackle my, you know, give up the fags when I feel better. Or I'll wait till after this or I'll wait till after that. And um, the reality is when you do something different, you feel better. You know, the idea around, you know, and having worked in in mental health situations for, for many t years, you know, you might have someone who's very depressed and they don't want to have a shower, you know, and they're lying in bed and they're saying, I don't, I prefer to stay in bed than have the shower. And your job is saying, no, but once you have the shower, you'll feel better. You know, so the idea of, you know, and it's not until you have the shower that you realize, actually, that was what I needed, you know. Um, and so from, from the point of view of getting over a fear of something, because I do... I subscribe to the idea that the eating disorder is not, especially anorexia, is not always a uh, pursuit of thinness, but a fear of weight gain. I would see it in that way, almost, you know, that, from that point of view. So the idea that if you were afraid of a spider, I couldn't get you over that fear without introducing a spider into the room. If you were fearful of, you know, and I've worked with lots of kids who dog phobia, I can't do that without bringing a dog into the room. So the, the only way that the anxiety maybe has to peak in order to come down. You know, so yeah. from the point of view of if my anxiety is about touching something, so my anxiety is 10 out of 10 and you're seven, eight, nine to the closer I get, it's the higher the anxiety. But sometimes it has to go to 10, 10, 10 and then come down the other side. So when it comes to eating disorder, you sort of might say, if I eat that, I'll put on 10 kilograms. There's no way of overcoming that fear without eating it and not putting on the 10 kilograms. You know what I mean? So the idea of you know, the, I think I used the example of, you know, if I was to say to you, put your finger on your nose and hold it there till 12 o'clock tonight, and I guarantee you, you won't drop dead. And you go, oh, my God, that's true. But if you were to dispel that, what would you do? And you'd say, well, I wouldn't put my finger on my nose and, and that would happen. So if you want to dispel the, 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 the volume and the intensity and the conviction of anorexia, it means you almost have to go against it and prove it wrong. You know, and the first time you might do it, you will eat something that it said was going to happen. It won't, you know, you won't put on the 10 kilos you thought you would, but you'll find reasons to justify that. And then you have to do it again. And then you have to, and the more you do it, you actually, it disarms the power of the voice because it's said, you know, 10 times at this point that this is going to happen and it's never happened once, but you can't overcome that without challenging it. You can't disprove the theory without doing the thing that's causing you the greatest level of anxiety. And so, um, that level of discomfort is really difficult. Don't get me wrong. I'm not minimizing it in any stretch, but I think the effectiveness of trying to challenge the eating sort of belief system is, is more than just challenging the thoughts. It actually has to be challenged in real life too, you know, in that way um, and persistently done. Uh, and, you know, you need buckets of support while you're doing that because it's really hard and it's really challenging. Um but it is necessary for me in terms of trying to to bring it down. You have to go to that point um, and back to that point. You know, when you do something, you feel better. Uh, and again, you know, what we want and what we need are oftentimes very different things. Um, and it's, there's a time in our lives where we may need someone in our lives to help us with that, you know, um, and and to help us to push us to go somewhere we, we don't want to go, you know. Um, uh, there's an example I, I would have used before with someone with an eating disorder and it's about you know I, I oftentimes would ask them you know, do you know do you have in your, anyone in your life I'm sure maybe Harry you've heard me say this before but if you have somebody small in your life is like 12 months or 15 months and let's say you're out having a picnic and they're eating something and a wasp lands on their and stings their mouth and they swell up and it's really sore so let's say after that event, this little baby is fearful of eating. They they think there's a wasp in everything. Um, and I would say to the girl or the person with the eating story, you're charged with looking after this person. What would you do? And they'd say, we'll bribe them or I'd offer them this or I did. And if that's not happening, you know, what? well, I, I can't let them fade away. I need to do something. So you can still acknowledge that the fear is real. 
that they're terrified, that they're petrified, and they don't want to do it, but still see the need that they have to do it in order to to not really deteriorate physically. That's the similar position to the people around you. You know, they they know this is awful. They know that you're terrified. They know that you believe there's a wasp in everything that we're giving you, but we know there's not. And that's why we need to persist with this. And and it's almost like the more the only way that child is going to get over that is by having something that doesn't have a wasp in it, you know, in order to regain the ability or the, the belief that that's OK. And I think, you know, when you're supporting someone with an eating disorder, you feel like this awful sergeant major all the time. And, and you really have to be reminded that you're doing that for the right reasons. Um, and even though somebody what somebody wants to happen and what some what might need to happen can be different. Um, but you can still hopefully posi- hold your hold that position of support um, while that process is taking place. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I think what you're saying is, you know, for the, obviously it's incredibly difficult and takes enormous patience and tolerance to be that support person. And um, it's important for the support person to acknowledge how terrifying yeah. it is. Yeah. And and I suppose not forget that the only way the fear will come down is that the person has to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I would always say recovery is an active process. You know, nobody else can eat for them Mm. and nobody, you know, they're the ones who have to actually do it at the end of the day and and go through the experience, as you say, of eating something and not gaining 10 kilos Mm. Um or looking after themselves and the world not falling apart or the sky not falling in, you know, that it takes kind of that learning in recovery of trying things and seeing that you get out the other side and nothing awful will happen. And mm. um, it's kind of ongoing process and it's, it's very grueling because it has to be done again and again and again and again. And that's really the, there's no magic bullet with it. Mm. Yeah. And, and again, that, that is that idea of you, you have to do something it's yeah. we can't recover in theory you know it's it doesn't work yeah we can talk about eating forever mm. but at the end of the day yeah i have to take action yeah so um i suppose you know with the theme of awareness week being about recovery i really liked in your book um the idea of imperfection um i think that that's a really lovely lovely um way of thinking about the world um and I suppose in your book, it's the idea that getting better or getting through something is not necessarily about achieving happiness, um, but rather about being able to live most of the time in the four seven zone, knowing that inevitably there are times when we will drift into the one to three or eight to ten zones. Um, what can you tell us about your thoughts around recovering from an eating disorder and that idea of happiness? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the idea of, um, and I, I would meet lots of young people and I would ask them about what they would hope to the, for, to get from a process. And, and some would say, I would love to be able to eat so low, uh, whatever I want and not worry about it. And I would say, well, that's not, realistic that's it, people who don't have an eating disorders can't even do that you know it's not about you know the, there's recovery isn't uh, being better as in fixed 100 uh, percent. you know it's about being better than you were you know and, and that's a process that you judge over a, a longer period of time than a week you know the idea that and I, I'd be a big fan of a lapse is not a relapse you know the fact that we we make mistakes and we slip and and, and the four to seven zone is a very forgiving model that says, look, I'm never saying to you, you have to stay in the four to seven all the time. That's just simply not true. And it's simply not possible either. Life will throw things at you, whether it's stress at work, a relationship breakdown, uh, a loss, a bereavement. We will go into those eight to 10 and one to three zones. Um, and that's fine. The problem is staying in there. You know, it's trying to find your way back. And, and the idea of imperfection is about tolerating the stuff that goes wrong rather than, you know, rather than prepare people for uh, how to cultivate the world in a way that it's perfect. We need to prepare people to manage the imperfections that inevitably will happen. You know, you're going to get hurt. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to, and, and again, fall down, you know, 
the issue is not about avoiding that. It's about responding to it when it happens. So how do we manage that? But if we go through life with an ideal that we'll never fall down, that we have to be happy all the time, that this, you know, better means, you know, that I never think about food, weight and shape ever again. Um, it, it simply isn't achievable. And it simply is, it's going to make you feel less effective on the journey of recovery if your goal is unrealistic too. You know, that that the the sense of um, you know, going out and trying to run 5k or 2k whatever the case may be it's not to be the best in the world it's to be the best that you can be within the things that are going on and some days you'll be tired and some days you'll won't feel the humor for it and some days you'll suck at it and some days it'll be better um and it's about almost embracing the inevitability of imperfection of things going wrong and the measure of you is not about how right you get it but how you respond to it when it goes a little bit wrong, you know, and, you know, if in sporting terms, you'll oftentimes, the hero is somebody who overcomes adversity. It's not somebody who avoids adversity. You know, there's no, there's a pretty sucky superhero story that someone who nothing ever bad happens to them that wouldn't, you know, that's yeah. not the Marvel movies, you know, it's about how you react to stuff that happens. Um, yeah. And I would try and always try and adjust the lens of perfection to adjust it to managing imperfection. You know, and and heroes manage imperfection, you know, or, you know, life is about managing the stuff that goes wrong that oftentimes determines us. But I think sometimes and again, maybe some of the recovery narrative is about being fine and never worrying about anything. And that's our destination. Um, utterly unhelpful messaging, in my view, you know, um, you know, if if this stuff is taking over 90 percent of my life let's aim that it takes over 70 then let's aim that it takes over 65 and let you know that's saying um and we'll, we'll, we'll keep going you know some people get to a certain level of better um and they can manage and they can function they can do things um and maybe there's a needs to be a break before they move to the next sta stage but if you if you start off thinking i'm going to be I have no worries in the world and i'm going to skip through life um then whatever recovery program you're part of is going to fail. It's going to fall short of that, you know. Um, and I talk a lot about in the book about average. You know, I think this idea of, I think it's the most disappointing thing is how we have demonized average. You know, the idea of if if we use the word average, it's oftentimes preempted by just average or only average. The reality is, Harry, like of all of us in on this call, you know, ten percent are going to be ex. ex exceptionally good at something 10% are going to be bad or under struggle and the other 80% are average regardless of what who's in the room if you make average bad you consign 80% of the population to feel discontent you know and I think the idea of I, I'd set you a, a test tomorrow if you meet anyone and they say how are you doing tell them you're having an average day I guarantee you they'll go what's wrong you know um, yeah. and this idea of the happiness thing and the exceptional thing and everyone being above average and everyone being in the 10%, like it really is uh, such a detrimental outlook to how we see ourselves in the world. Um, because like I said earlier on, not everyone can be in that top 10%. And regardless of the standard, it's still going to be the, like the still the majority of us are going to be average, you know? So um, I, I, my objective is to, D undemonize average and bring that back. Average is something that should be met with relief, not disappointment. You know, I know plenty of people in this work that would take your hand off to be average, you know. Um, um, and again, I think our systems are set up to to not support that. You know, go to any TY awards night and the same five kids go home with every prize. You know, it's it, it's really about outcome, not about efforts. It isn't we as a society, we don't value maybe the things like I, uh, my daughter is dyslexic and she'd be here on a Thursday night, putting an hour into her spelling tests and she'll get sixes and sevens out of 10. Her little brother barely looks at them and he hits 10 every time. And all people see is 10 and six. Nobody sees what's gone into that. And uh, I think that demands us to kind of revisit what actually are we glorifying in this, in young people. And um, if it's grades, accolades and prizes, I think we're going to have a lot more eating disorders issues because that's another striving for exceptionalism. And it's about 
not being average. Uh, in many ways, that's almost what drives that too. So, um, yeah, we need to cop on to ourselves, I think, and 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 have a look at ourselves because I think that's that's certainly not helping, you know. And but there's another part, isn't there, about when we think about eating disorder recovery, and that's um more that subjective experience of being comfortable in your skin. And I I often think that um you know people think that in recovery or when they're better I don't some people don't even like using the word recovery but when they're out of it you know that they will feel um a hundred percent of the time comfortable in their own skin and happy with their own bodies as well and I think that um you know that's also an impossible idea that you know I think we all have to acknowledge that none of us feel a hundred percent comfortable in our own skin all of the time and that's okay yeah and, and again I would say body image is a very subjective experience even within the individual you know I I could be heading out somewhere and I'll put on my black shirt and I'll be really looking forward to it and I'll have a great day and I could be looking in the mirror going you look amazing go you know go at it I could be going out the next night to somewhere I don't really feel I really want to go I've had a rough old day I feel tired and that shirt will just feel sticky on me and it won't sit right and it won't you so my body hasn't changed in the 24 hours, but the issue is that the subjectivity of my own, where I'm at in my life impacts on my body image. So the idea of, you know, we all go on diets in January after New Year's, whereas most of us don't go on diets when we're on holiday in Portugal for two weeks in the summer. You know, the idea of the dissatisfaction, it, that subjectivity of dissatisfaction is so determined on where we're at in our lives and how we feel in that moment. Um that that's a really unreliable thing to to almost have as a metric of being better or not um because it's so momentary you know in that way and i, I would see very much potty image as being something that uh, could change in the hour you know from good to bad and certainly having no implication on my weight or shape you know yeah, absolutely. When I'm trying to talk about it, I find it really difficult to explain kind of what it is even. But I suppose one of the ways I think about it is that our body image is the idea of how we think we look to the outside world. And so it's an idea and our mm. ideas can be influenced by how we're feeling about ourselves or our day, as you say. Um, and so it it's it's a movable feast. It can change depending on how we feel. And it, that's the same for everybody, not just for a person mm. who has any disorder with, you know, very distorted body image. It's, yeah. Yeah. And again, it's so open to contamination by something utterly unrelated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You could feel, yeah. oh, I'm really sucking as a parent and I'm not really getting this right. And this trousers isn't fitting me right. You know, so there's that uh, almost idea that it, uh, it attaches itself to yeah. whatever sort of, grievance we have with ourselves in that moment you know the idea of how we look to other people is easily influenced for sure yeah yeah so um i suppose almost finally coleman um i know a question that i get all the time um from you know parents or supporters is how do i get my loved one with an eating disorder to want to recover um, which is all about desire. And you speak about desire in your book, you know, desire to live, desire to desire to want something more than the eating disorder, which, of course, is a really difficult thing because the eating disorder, as you've said, is in some way keeping that person's desire alive. It's become their survival strategy. In your book, you describe, you know, a person drowning and it becomes the flotation device um so what are your thoughts on that question um you know how can i get my loved one to want to recover yeah i mean it's a really tricky one but i i've started to think about this in recent years and ask myself you know what we pitch as a recovery or a, something desirable or an attention may not indeed be what that person wants you know the idea of if we go back to the idea that the eating sort of maybe a way of, you know, preoccupying about something 95% of the time because of the 5% that's really troublesome. Um, then, you know, what we're saying is we're, we want to see more of the 5%. We want to see all the things that you are nervous about or overwhelmed by 
and we're promising you all of this stuff in return, that may be exactly the opposite in terms of what that person wants. So in, in the idea of that, the, the, the resistance to change metaphor, it's almost like what I'd say is the young person is like someone in, in the water and they're flapping around, they're feeling overwhelmed, the waves are getting, you know, they're suffocating a little bit in it. And the eating disorder almost offers uh, itself like a boy, a flotation device, you say, kind of to grab onto. And in that first bit, it stabilizes things. You know, now I feel in a bit more control. I don't feel as overwhelmed, et cetera. And I think then the people who come along in the boat are like families or treatment people or clinicians. And they say, come on, hop on board and we will bring you over to the, the main land and we'll, we'll bring you back there. And as they're getting on the boat, we say, well, you can't take that life ring with you you have to throw that off and they're kind of saying well but this is the thing that saved me this is the thing that makes me feel better why would you make me get rid of the one thing that has helped and we would say well mm -hmm. because it's not allowed here so let go um and many young people will say actually no i'm fine here and they'll jump back into the water and bob along in the life boy and another boat comes along and another boat comes along and sometimes what we were looking over at the mainland as kind of safety and solidity and you know it's there's but they're looking at it as there's universities there's exams there's break heartbreak there's all these sorts of things and so when we're saying we will get you there that might be that that might be might not be the destination they want to go in so oftentimes what we're offering may not indeed be that so it's about saying look bring the life boy with you and we will try and we'll get to the shore then and then we'll help you as you get along there and Soon enough, as they're walking around the mainland and they're starting to feel a bit more comfortable and they're, it, it's not as daunting as it, they thought it was, the life ring that they're carrying around becomes a hindrance. You know, So then it becomes redundant. I don't need this anymore. And what you want is for them to surrender it and say, look, I don't want this. I'll keep going and I want to do all these other things. But oftentimes, us trying to struggle with it in the water, trying to wrestle it off them um, and promising something that looks full of trepidation rather than looking like anything like hope. Um, I, I think probably gets it wrong, you know? Um, and in many ways, I oftentimes use the example of when we say to somebody, uh, you can't really see me here, but what we're saying to someone in eating disorders, give me your eating disorder and I'll give you this. And it's like, we're holding something behind our back and they're saying, well, what's behind your yeah. back? And you go, I don't really know, but I, it's gotta be better than this. So just that, you know, it's not a very attractive bargaining chip to say, give me that and I'll give you yeah. something else without knowing what that something else yeah. is. Um, and sometimes we say, we'll give you pressure, we'll give you vulnerability, we'll give you lots of unknowns and we'll give you a lot more expectation. And they're kind of going, no, nah, hang on to this, thanks. You know, so um, the, the wanting to change may not be there at the start, but it's almost you become mm -hmm. convinced of it. So when they get to the mainland and they're managing and they're making a few friends and they're trying to con reconnect and now they're realizing actually this ring is holding me back i actually it's not mm. it's not helping me float and i, I use the sentence that sometimes the thing that we believe is saving us is the actual thing that's drowning us you know um mm. and it's about trying to find a way for them to see that i think that's it i think it's about trying for them to see rather than us you know trying to wrestle it off them because well we know better um I do believe there has to be something about their own desire for that to be different. Um, but I wouldn't expect that from the off. I think that comes over time. You know, um, yeah. most people will probably engage reluctantly to begin with. And may, that may well may, kind of develop into hesitance or uncertainty or lack of clarity. And it's a process. Um, uh, I don't remember how many who said... I'm ready to go. Let's 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 have it. Let's get rid of this right now. Um, that's that's quite an unusual presentation, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I use a similar metaphor, um, except it's a branch, not a flotation device, and and mm. um, there isn't a boat. But um, when I when I'm talking about it, the group of people are on they're on the mainland, and what I always think about that as well is that if they're all giving different messages. You know, if they're all saying different things, you know, do it this way, do it this way, or you should do this, you should do that. The person will feel even more unsafe. And so they'll cling more to their flotation device. And so it's, at, you know, from, from a carer's perspective or a family perspective, they need to know also that they 
needle to kind of go with the one approach and know what they're doing and think through what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing as well mm. um, to help the person feel safe enough to kind of move towards the mainland. Yeah, and it is about, you know, almost feeling safe enough to let go. You know, uh, it's it's a really big ask to ask somebody to to jump into the unknown um uh and 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 give up something that to them is the only thing that they have you know maybe at that time yeah. you know yeah um yeah for sure none I, of us I, like, pardon none of us like to do it no absolutely not um yeah and look again we all have crutches and habits that we developed over time that we wouldn't be handing over it the first time of asking either you know um and especially if they're serving a really important function, you know, um, and I think that's the thing that to remember, it's not that somebody is doing this to make your life more difficult. They're doing it to make their life bearable, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coleman, is there anything else that you'd like to add that you think I've missed out on or that you would like to say from your book, which is a really wonderful read? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from the point of view of um, the the capacity to to get it wrong and, and learn from that is really something I really wanted to get in it. I think there's so much of the help and direction is about getting it right all the time and being the right person and being um, and especially when you're in a really intense situation, like if somebody in your home is recovering from an eating disorder, like you might lose your rag sometimes you might get upset sometimes you might say the wrong thing sometimes you might even get it wrong and 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 i think the idea of you know giving ourselves such a hard time and you know almost wallowing in that a little bit and, and allowing that to err is human you know it's about saying look i'm going to go back and say look that wasn't my finest hour and i'm really sorry but look i was that was an nine out of 10 reaction rather than a seven, or that was a two reaction rather than a four. Um, and I remember one kid saying to me, you know, she said, my mom doesn't get it, but I know she's trying. And I love that. I thought that was a, an awesome thing. I think there is that sense of, well, if, you ha if you're still trying, you haven't failed, you know? Um, yeah. And from that point of view, both if you're the individual trying to come through the eating disorder or you're the parent who's trying to help navigate somebody through it, if you're still trying, you haven't failed, you know, and, and I think that's the, and it's, it's hard, it's tough, it's not about, uh, and, and again, you know, so much of the narrative is quick and easy, you know, oh, just do this, just do this, I, I, anything emotional and psychological is not just do this, it's do a bit of this and a bit of that for a bit of time, and then you'll see yeah. something different, you know, yeah, so, so yeah, so I think it's about moderating our own expectations, you know. Yeah. Brilliant, Coleman. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm going to see if there are any questions now from um, the people watching. Um, I don't think we have any questions, funnily enough. Or do we? We'll give people a minute to see do they have any questions. Thank you, Linda. Linda says, yeah, I'm going to give an eight to 10 comment. That was just fantastic. Thank you, Linda. And he says, off to buy the book. Um, Michelle asks, in um, relation to people who are into bodybuilding competitions and binge eating, any advice? Yeah, again, I would say that that's a a world that kind of feeds into the perfection narrative as well, you know, and the and there's you know so many feed content that are about supplements and getting this right and getting and so much conflicting advice around uh, nutrition and what is healthy and what is right and you know, um, it it really is. Is the word a quagmire? Is that what it is? Like it's just this horrendously confusing space to try and navigate. 
And I think for people who are impressionable, it can be really difficult because you're constantly trying to trying to find that next thing. Um, and it is an extreme of training intensely till you know you can't move your arms and then recovering intensely and in many ways it's quite a bulimic type of culture you know it's it's uh it's a binge purge type culture in that way um and even throughout the dialogues around bodybuilding they do these things like you know, build and cut so you have to eat like crazy to build it up and then you have to cut like fat, uh, like fat to try and get into these competitions and um it's really easy to get into a, a t- kind of dysmorphic space um in that world um and again i think because of the you know if you were doing this 25 years ago you would have had two magazines to to look on you know in terms of how to do that the influencer market here is so prolific um from that point of view um i see many young boys as well as girls kind of getting caught up into that um conditioning strength and conditioning sort of stuff um it, it's really about trying to control their naivety to them to the narrative to try and get them to become critical consumers of that content and be able to choose who to listen to and who not to um and always be very wary of the quick fix you know because this market is notorious for you know take this uh fat burning tablet or take this and and uh it's very unregulated space from the point of view of fda stuff so um yeah it's really encouraging the person to take a step back to be a critical consumer of the content and to challenge it and not just can take everything as gospel and again for younger people that can be really hard and just in relation to binge eating and you know i suppose um, binging and purging do you, would you see those as kind of eight to ten and one to three living in those kind of two sphere two realms that you know when somebody because I know that restriction and hunger is such a huge part of the binge eating disorder kind of cycle um, and also with bulimia that there's kind of this you know the anxiety provoking that kind of restriction and then there's the kind of collapsing of that for whatever reason and it goes into that eight to ten of binging or how do you think about that sorry just you broke up there a little bit I mean, can you ask that one more time sorry oh, sorry yeah so just in terms of binge eating and you know the bin binging and purging i was just saying do you see that as you know a kind of one to three and then eight to ten kind of reactions that the anxiety is is driving something um that then you know kind of collapses and the there's a huge kind of reaction to it yeah very much so and, and again i would see you know you see young people who say you know right that's it i'm never going to eat i'm not eating anything tomorrow and they will you know get to about half six in the evening and then they'll be starving they'll have something and then the floodgates will open and that's well i've broken it now and so the binge happens and then the next morning they set the goal again um, and the advice is don't set the goal of not eating, you know, almost like the then and that's where the the kind of eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, it's overcorrection. You know, if you're trying too hard, it'll have a consequence of ping in the other direction. Do you know what I mean? So the further towards 10 you go, the more likely you'll end up at the one, you know. And so um it really is about again, if you hit a seven expectation, you might get a four as a response. You know, you go for a 10, you get a one. Um, and I would definitely see that as it's kind of that elastic band theory that it, it pings back to the power of which you stretch it, you know. Yeah. Another question there, Coleman, um, saying you talk about society having unreal expectations, but how do we stop this? What are your thoughts on on that? Uh, that would be a book that would sell if I had the answer. I mean, a societal problem is is it's it's the old multi pronged approach. But I, I think we, you know schools, um, families, our own value system, like things like you know a, a quick few quick, quick wins. I think we should readdress the points race. I think that's really problematic. I think we should look at children's sport. I think that's a symptom of how we're losing the run of ourselves. You know, in terms of. Uh, over involvement and expectation um and i would try and find a way of valuing effort rather than outcome i think if we can get back to something about that and um, i'd love to see an award in a school for maybe a kid who who suffered a bereavement of a close family member and that they got an award for coming back to school and getting through that year 
rather than the kid who's the fastest or the brightest. I just think um, we shape the value systems. Um, so we have to, you know, hold up the mirror and, 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 and readdress that and say, well, what do we really want? Because what we're valuing at the moment isn't necessarily either sustainable and certainly not, in my view, desirable either, you know. Um, another question, is there a different clinical approach for an adult who's been in an eating disorder pattern for years than to an adolescent who's new to the disorder? Um, I think there is because probably the person who's had the established condition for many years maybe has had has heard these things before. Um, um, but what I would say is, you know, the the idea that something something can change in you, you know, I I remember seeing someone who I treated a number of times and I met this person first when they were 14 um, and met them again when they were 24, 25. Um, and they returned to me to work around 26. And they had, as a, they'd met someone in their lives who'd said, look, it's me or the eating disorder, I'm out. Um, and for that, that last time they came back, they were motivated. They wanted to change. They wanted it to be different. There was something in it, as you said earlier on, that they had, they wanted more than the eating disorder. Um, and I would say that they managed to get to a really impressive level of recovery on that basis after 11 years of not making any impact in it. So the idea of, of, of I would never um, dismiss the opportunity of a new approach, maybe just clicking with you, but also something changing in yourself um, that allows you to want to recover or allows you to be able to recover or the conditions might just be right for you to recover. Sometimes this stuff is down to timing. You know, I've had many young people who've come to me and I've said, you know, that they're not ready to recover yet. You know, there's this idea that almost, um, and, and I use the example, this is, might be off the rails a little bit, but I, I when I was about, um, 20, I, I, I used into my cars and I loved cars and I wanted this, this Honda Prelude car, and it was this 2.2 liter petrol car, right? And everyone who I spoke to said, you're crazy. You won't be able, I was a nursing student at the time. I didn't have a penny. They said, you, you will never be able to fill that with petrol. And I said, no, I, I, lads, I'm, it's going to work. I trust me, I'll just do this, I'll do that. And I bought the car and I was, you know, king of the hill for about three weeks driving around the place. Everyone thought it was lovely, but it was drank the petrol. I had not had a penny to put in. I remember trying to get two pounds behind the couch to try and put petrol in it and I had to sell it um, and I sold it and bought a 1.6 diesel but I always say that to young people I had to fail for my approach to not work nobody could have convinced me not to get it if I didn't buy it I would be just still driving around looking at Honda Preludes going I wish I had one of them I almost had to be allowed to try it because my approach was the wrong one but I needed to make sure that it was the wrong one and so by allowing me to to fail in that way i drove my diesel car safe in the knowledge that i'd <laughs> i've given it a shot yeah and uh and sometimes when when i meet young people there's that approach as well that they think i can they can manage it and you just have to make sure give them a shot at, at almost allowing them to fail safely so that they can go back and engage the next time does that make sense harriet makes sense yeah absolutely mm. makes sense yeah mm. yeah like you like you were saying earlier they have to do it to know mm. They have to go through. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. Um, somebody's asking, um, do you think it's okay to show this webinar to a person who has an eating disorder? Of course. I don't Why not? Yeah. yeah, I think it's okay. Um, what advice would you give to food educators who want to frame treats as part of a healthy diet in a sensible way for children? Um, yeah, I have a position on this. I, I, I don't like the way in which we describe good and bad foods. I, I think that's dangerous. Um, and I, I understand why schools need to do it with the kind of obesity problem in mind and you know, the surveilling lunchboxes and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I would be a fan of good and bad amounts of food rather than good and bad types of food. You know, I think there's... Uh, and I've had so many fallout of somebody going into a school and giving it some sort of a misinformed chat about trans fats or something and having somebody in crisis after it. Um, we need to be really careful around who we get our nutritional advice from um, and need to be really careful about the messaging as well. Um, so for me, not a big fan of the good and bad foods, you know, the 
you know, demonizing treats, that sort of stuff. Um, for me, it's about portions and amounts and a healthy relationship with food, uh, all types of food. Um, uh, and I'm not so sure that's a, that sensible voice again is something that is, that gains a lot of traction. You know, the, the slow and steady again, it's not going to get the, tra- that's not going to go viral on you, you know, um, the mad stuff is, you know, but, but yeah, no, I, 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 we need to be really, especially around small children and young children. Uh, and Harriet, you and I know that you were seeing younger people presenting with eating disorders now in fifth and sixth class, um, as opposed yeah. to maybe second and third year where we, so this exposure to this stuff is having an impact that they're becoming more body conscious um, much earlier. Much younger. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that's something we really need to be mindful of and, and watch out for, for sure. Yeah. Um, another question, um, other than your fabulous four to seven zone book, are there any perfectionism specific resources you both would recommend to a clinical or non-clinical population? Thank you for a most insightful, engaging webinar. Um, I like Brenny Brown's stuff on perfectionism. I think she speaks really well about it. Um, I don't agree with all her stuff, but that stuff I really think is good. I, um, she talks about it as a, a kind of a, an avoidance of engaging in it. Like the idea of there can be no progress without vulnerability, you know, so we have to be vulnerable when we're making any change or engaging in any transition. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not doing something, you know, it's almost like it has to happen. And so perfectionism is an attempt to avoid that vulnerability so that I can make a change without feeling vulnerable. And it simply isn't possible because the the rigidity of the perfectionism means that it isn't sustainable and it fails. And so you become overwhelmed. Um, and I, I love the concept of surmountable stress. You know, we have to be stressed. We have to be vulnerable. We have to be uncomfortable. But once it's surmountable and we can come out the other side, then it's going to stand to us. You know, um, what we don't want to be is overwhelmed. Um, and I think perfectionism promises an avoidance of that. But as soon as one card in that house of cards is wrongly placed, overwhelming is coming at you like a train, you know. So, um, yeah, but I, I'd look into her stuff, even though the TED Talk stuff is, is quite good. Um, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Great. Um, how can I reassure my daughter that it will get better? Eating very well, but there is myriad of stuff going on in her head at the moment. Emotions are very volatile with her. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm guessing the idea of um, it could get better, <laughs> again, falling into the trap that it'll stay better, you know, it'll get easier to manage this stuff, you know, almost like, uh, I, um, and it'll become more familiar to you and you'll get better at managing it. You know, it's almost like it's not about, um, you know, how do I stop my garden from getting overgrown? You know, well, we learn how to cut it and we'll stay on top of it and we'll manage it. So, but it'll still grow back. You know, this is not, it's not a one-off. Um, I love, a, there's a kind of a roller coaster parenting approach that I, I, I really advocate. It's this idea of it, it, approach your child like you're approaching a roller coaster and you're scared and she's scared. And just you're sitting in the carriage. Don't promise everything is going to be okay because you don't know that. But say to her, look, I'm scared. You're scared. I don't know what's up here. It could get scary. But whatever happens, we're in this together and I've got you. And it's almost like that you're you're va- you're guaranteeing your presence. You're not guaranteeing an outcome. Um, and that allows her to not be, she's come to false promises that, you know, if you say everything's OK and it's not, then you become unreliable. Um, but what you are saying is, you know, we've got this. Um, and I think that's how we should approach most parental dilemmas is I don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, I'm here. Yeah. I love that. Colm. Fantastic. Mm. It's nice. A really nice way of thinking about it. Um, what advice do I give to a dad of a seven year old whose mother died last year when he is reluctant to see that this could be a coping mechanism for her? How to change the dialogue at home around eating? Oh, I mean, it's a really challenging one. And I, 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 I'm I, making gross generalizations here, but this gentleman might be struggling on his own there in that situation and see any sort of advice as criticism, you know, uh, and I think you need to be really careful around how you say that or how that comes across or to be, you know, that 
um, you know, if you're struggling to manage something and somebody comes in with a piece of advice, as well intended as it might be, you just hear you're not doing this right or you're not getting it right. And it, uh, and it isn't about the, the concerned person here proving they're right by proving that the child has a problem or dad proving it right because she doesn't remove your agenda out of it and just say, well, let's 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 look at what 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 is going on. What are the issues? And how could we support her with this as opposed to how can we pathologize her with this? You know, it's not about if somebody's saying, you know, because when it comes to mental health problems, there's no definitive test. So there isn't an MRI for this or there isn't an X-ray or there isn't a blood test. So you're you're making assumptions based on your knowledge and what you know of that person. Um, and if you go in saying look, there's no right or wrong here, we're not it shouldn't be about you and I arguing over what intervention is required or if any intervention is required what we need to do is have a chat about how can we both support this kid as best as possible and but being really mindful to to present that as support as opposed to uh, and even concern can come across as criticism so it's just really about how can i help you with this um rather than perhaps a tone of i don't think you're getting this right or i think you're missing something does that make sense yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's a really nice way of thinking about it. And we probably have time for one more, Coleman. Yeah. Um, do you ever feel you need to one day be in a position to speak openly to friends and family about your eating disorder? Or is it OK that it may always be something private that you never feel comfortable in sharing? Or is this part of recovery to not feel shame or judgment? Uh, I would say that that's down to each individual in terms of your own comfort with, and it depends so much on the person you're addressing and where you are at in that moment. Um, I think if a relationship is established and there's something there that is of meaning, then that person may well be able to hear that and support that and get that and, and be a, of a great support to you. Uh, you know, and again, it's this idea of, the shame that we feel in our head is a bit like the, 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 the anticipation of it is worse than the act. You know, oftentimes when we say things to people who matter to us and people are important, their response is so much better than we ever imagined it was going to be. You know, it's almost like a bit like we said earlier on, you know, you need to do something to feel better. You may need to trust somebody with that information to feel less burdened by it. Um, but I would say to you, you know, you select carefully who that person is that you 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 trust enough to share that with. Um, I I would say there's a ninety percent chance you'll be pleasantly surprised by their reaction. Um, and I think there's a ninety percent chance that you'll feel better having offloaded that yourself. Um, mm. but um, I think self disclosure should never be like a timed task that you have to go out and tell someone by next week. Um. Mm because that's not how that works. It's, it's really about your ability to, to feel comfortable enough to do that. Um, and whatever comfort you feel when you say it and the other person hears it and responds positively to it, that comfort goes up a couple of notches even after that. Because when you're carrying a secret like that, it is contributing to some degree of discomfort in that relationship, knowing that it's there, uh, if that makes any sense. So um, time it, uh, trust it, um, and I wish you all the best with that. Yeah. Thank you, Coleman. Great. So just before we close, I just want to let everybody know that tomorrow at 12.15, we have another webinar um, focusing on navigating body changes through the life cycle um, and that our support ser services are available to anyone who might want to talk anything through um, from this discussion as well. And all of the events for Awareness Week are available on our website and on our social media channels. So, Coleman, I just want to say a huge thank you to you for such an interesting discussion. Um, as I said, I absolutely loved your book um, and I love the idea of the 47 zone. And thank you for all of that. Pleasure as always, guys. Thanks ever so much. Bye now. Bye. Bye bye.